penultimate paper um, is being presented on behalf of his colleagues by Simon Brennan um, on uh, detection of uh, recent uh, archaeology and long craters. Yes. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so let me just give you a short motivation. Um, where detecting bomb craters is something useful. Uh, we're dealing with a special kind of uh, cultural heritage here, and that is unexploded bombs from World War II. Um, um, the, the Allied forces dropped about one million of those bombs over Europe, and it is assumed that at least 10% of them did not explode. Uh, so you can calculate how many unexploded that gives. And a lot of them have already been uh, diffused and removed, but there are still thousands to go. And we're interested in finding them, not because they're so really interesting, but because they're dangerous for construction projects, and as I learned, also for um, archaeological excavations. So now what you can do is that for a given area, you can make a preliminary risk estimation uh, by looking at aerial images that were taken, taken at that time, like this one, for example. And then when you, when you geo-reference it um, onto modern satellite <coughs> images, and then you look for a uh, different kind of evidence for um, increased warfare activities there, like artillery stations or trenches, and especially bomb craters, because if you expect that for every 10 bomb craters you get one unexploded bomb, um, that's a um, useful clue. Now there are specialized companies who do exactly that by hand so far. And in the Divisa project, uh, the detection and visualization of unexploded ordnance risks, um, we made a cooperation with one of those companies, the Luftbilddatenbank Dr. Karls GmbH, which I will call LBDB from now on. Um, and we were trying to add computer support for those uh, time-consuming activities of geo-referencing uh, the old images onto modern satellite images and the detection of bomb craters. Um, both is not very easy because for the geo-referencing a lot has changed in the landscape in the last 70 years, so buildings, vegetation, uh, land use in general. And also the images are of uh, quite bad quality. They're really taken from, from the airplanes, not from satellites. Um, they're not orthogonal or anything like that. Yeah, and last year at the CAE, as far as I know, a colleague of mine presented the geo-referencing part. And in the last year, we focused on the detection of the bomb craters. So. Our approach is quite straightforward. Uh, we're also using a CNN um, on, on the source images. Then we get something like a confidence map of a bomb crater being existent in some location. And after some post-processing of those results, we get the final detections. So about the data. Um, this company we cooperated with, their main job was providing us with training data because they have a lot of finished uh, analysis projects that they did by hand. And so we got 21 projects with 111 images and approximately 10,000 craters. And in all of those projects we have a region of interest uh, where they were analyzed because there was a planned construction project or whatever and usually multiple overlapping images in this area. Because um, like when you have an image from 1943, where there are no bomb craters, and then in a later image you have bomb craters, you can, you can be more sure that it's really a bomb crater than the tree or something else. Yeah. The problem was that the craters were provided in, in world coordinates in a GIS uh, system and not really um, assigned to the images in, they were, uh, in which they were visible because, as I said, they are 
uh, multiple of those, and not in all of them we see the craters. Yeah, then we did some some analysis of the data we got here, and they make up only about 0.4 percent of of the areas of interest. We have 77 craters about by uh, square kilometer, and here are the the diameters of, of the craters. You, you see most of them are like 6 to 8 meters in diameter and there is hardly anything above 12 meters. And that is what we used for the, for the generation of our data set. Uh, first we had to assign the craters to the images in which they were visible and we did that by hand, uh, which was uh, a bit of a tiresome task and also I have to say that this is the part where errors could have happened in the generation of the data set because it was done by us and not by the, by the specialized company. And yeah, doing that we ended up with uh, 20,000 creators in uh, image coordinates because some of them were visible in more than, than one image. And then we extracted patches that we could later use to train the convolutional neural network. And we did that by moving a sliding <coughs> window over the regions of interest. And if there was a crater in that window, we said that's a positive example. And if there were, were, was no crater, that was a negative example. And we did that instead of just extracting patches at the center position of every crater because uh, with that, we implicitly had uh, translational variants introduced in our data set. And yeah, all the patches had the same ground size because uh, we knew that there were no craters bigger than uh, 12 meters. And so we said we want to provide, provide also some context to the classifier. So we took a 20 by 20 meter window and scaled that to the input of, of the CNN. So we ended up with 85,000 examples per class. I mean, with the translational variation and everything. So, and the network that we used um, was the DenseNet, which was at least last year uh, the state of the art in image classification. And the idea is that every layer in one of those uh, dense blocks receives information from every uh, preceding layer in that block um, so that like this layer it cannot happen that this layer is completely uh, detached from what's happened before and that works very well for classification of natural images and after trying uh, simpler networks and other machine learning approaches that did not really work uh, we said okay Let's, let's try with that one, and that worked actually pretty well. Yeah, so what this network does, of, as most of you probably know, is that you, you feed it an input image and you get, for each class, um, a probability of that image belonging to that class. And we trained it with uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of positive and negative examples. Actually, there are in nature more, more negative examples, but then the network would just learn to posit, uh, classify everything as negative, and that's not what we want. And of course, we made also a, a training and test set with a ratio of uh, 1 to 3. Yes, and after some experiments, um, this is what we ended up with. We get uh, an accuracy of uh, 91%. So that's the probability, given the network a random image, that it's classified right. And now this can be used for detection. I mean, we, we did not use a, an RCS CNN as the, the previous talk, but we just simply took a sliding window as a, as a, first, um, as a first approach that was that exactly corresponds to the way the data set was generated. So it was also 20 meters by 20 meters, uh, with a stride of one fourth of that. And so that every window can, classif can be classified with that. And 
if we have this ratio of one to one of positive and negative examples, uh, it works quite well. But in a real life scenario, the precision drops to 0 0.042, which is not only bad, it's uh, horrible. Um, of course, you can, you can, you can play with the uh, decision threshold. You say, for example, only if you're 90% sure that it's a crater, we say it's a crater. But um, as you see here, also this does not uh, bring the precision to something that's useful. So we tackled this by some post-processing, um, by implying spatial information or decision if something is really a crater or not. And the first idea was what we call the spatial proximity prior, is that bombs were always dropped in clusters, like there was not a plane going, dropping a single bomb and, and going away. Um, so lonely craters are more likely to be false positives. And also, um, through the sliding window approach, um, craters are detected by multiple windows, like that one, for example. And if something is a real crater, it's very likely that it's detected multiple times. So we throw away all those detections uh, which are not part of such a cluster. And then the non-maximum suppression is actually just something to remove those clusters and re reduce them to one single detection. So we, to practi practically uh, apply that, we use uh, the outputs from the CNN and store them in such a confidence map where here uh, blue represents low confidence and red, uh, dark red, high confidence in there being a crater. Then for the spatial proximity prior, we, we Gauss filter it so that uh, lone, lonely peaks um, are penalized. And after that only we threshold it, then remove small uh, connected components, uh, which are not clusters. And then we reduce that, I hope that's still visible, to the actual, actual detections, which looks like that. And then as we have uh, multiple overlapping images in this area, we must merge those detections by transforming uh, the crater positions to world coordinates in the, in the GIS environment, um, then performing some clustering uh, based on a neighborhood defined by some Euclidean distance and reduce them just to their um, to their centroids. This does not really improve the performance of the whole thing but makes things easier for the, for the user because as, as we will see later this is not really suitable for a fully automatic approach but the things have to be corrected then by the, by the specialist. So the end-to-end -end performance with the post-processing um, is not optimal, but still more usable than what we have seen before. So we now have a precision of 74%, uh, and a recall of 0.6, which now was worse than before, but you have to make some trade-off. And you can also play around with this ratio we just optimized here for the F1 score, but yeah. And as you also see, it very much depends on the area you're observing. So these, these are the individual projects that, that we tested the end-to-end uh, -end solution on. And yeah, can be observed that, for example, on rural areas like that one, it works quite well. And um, in urban areas where you have a lot of buildings and other stuff that can be confused with craters, it works not so well. And as an outlook, uh, we are just trying to, to do a follow-up project. I mean, we have to apply for financing. We don't know if it's, if it's happening, but the idea is um, that we extend our, our approaches to a larger scale so that we can, for example, do whole cities or even whole countries by the optimized uh, registration of whole um, flight strips because the, the planes always took multiple images on each flight and their whole strips. And 
yeah, to provide those large scale risk maps over large areas. Okay, that was it from my side. Thank you very much.